Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking to skip through this video, then I made it a lot easier for you to do that. So don't just go skip it on your own. Look down in the description. I gave you a table of contents of every component of the engine. So hang on, check that out. Hey guys, and welcome to Jeep Sheep TV. And this is engine month. Uh, well, specifically this engine, the 2.5 liter inline four cylinder Jeep engine. Now I would call it the 2.5 liter inline four cylinder Jeep engine month, but it just doesn't flow. Let's get dirty. There you go. There is just so much great content in this video series that I'm gonna have to break this video into multiple parts. This is part one. If you wanna see the other parts of this video, you can look down in the description and I'll have links to those. This should also be in a playlist. If you haven't utilized the playlists in my channel yet, you can check that out. I usually have things categorized and then you can just binge watch, so <laughs> do that. All right, you guys, like I said, this is the 2.5 liter inline four cylinder Jeep engine. Now this one here has all of the covers removed. So quick update for you. Last winter, I pulled this engine out of my Jeep. This engine uh, is out of my 1994 Jeep Wrangler. It's the YJ sitting right here behind me. And it pulled about 200,000 miles. It was overheated. It was run out of coolant, it was run out of oil, it was just abused in every possible way, and it never stopped running. Uh, it did not have the best compression. It was tired and it knocked like a diesel. I actually had a guy ask me if I had swapped a diesel into the Jeep, which was a really proud moment for me. So it was time for the engine to go and of course you would think that I should swap in a V8 and instead I put the exact same engine in so I could make these lovely videos for you and continue to go slow. But no, uh, it's been a really good experience and I've had a lot of fun learning about this engine so I wanna share that with you. That's what this majorly long video is about. It's about this engine and what it looks like on the inside. We're gonna tear it apart, uh, it's not gonna come, completely disassembled because I'm missing a couple specialty tools, but we're gonna get as close as possible. And we're gonna try and figure out what was causing the low compression and knocking. And maybe we can figure it out, maybe not. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and start looking at this engine. All right, you guys, first we're going to look at some of the markings on this engine. And this is where you, the subscriber, can maybe help me out with what some of these are. Uh, it'll be a fun group activity for us. So the first thing I spy on here is Oh wow, it's hard for you to see that, but it's an E20A, E20A. So I'm assuming maybe a part number of some kind. We have a 117, which just gets me all kinds of excited. If you play the wildly successful franchise of Halo on Xbox or PC, you'll know that 117 is the number of Master Chief. So that's pretty cool. To me, we have an NH, beats me. And then we have 94. Now. Maybe, just maybe, that's the year. This is a 1994 Wrangler, so 94 seems pretty fitting. All right, and moving on, this is where your intake and exhaust is all on the same side on this engine. And then you'll notice these rockers. This is a push rod engine. It does not have overhead cams. The TJ got an engine that followed this, which did have dual overhead cams, but those engines were not known for reliability. These ones, however, are known for reliability. They're known to be very reliable. And in fact, me saying that I only got 200,000 miles is actually low for this engine, which is crazy. Now you'll also notice that the head is different color than the base. That's because I cleaned the head. I was doing some work on it and I pressure washed it. So the entire engine came out looking like this and it was very gross. We also have a 5300840 zero, zero, 
J, which is pretty cool. Some kind of logo down here. We have this logo right here, which is really hard to see because it's all grimy. That's okay. Uh, oil filter goes here. The distributor would be there. And I think that's just a mounting feature. Your dipstick goes there. Bringing us to the front of the engine. Coolant thermostat goes right here. And then your water pump goes right there. Timing chain goes here and it's got a little tensioner. And that's it. This is an incredibly simple engine. There is not a lot to it, uh, which is part of its reliability. It's pretty great. All right, guys, starting now and quite possibly for the remainder of the majority of this video, you're not gonna be able to see my head. So, sorry about that. Uh, this is just so you can see the engine a lot better. These bolts on top here, a 5 8 fits incredibly well, but also a 16 fits very well. The 5 8 does indeed fit better. Now, the reason why I'm showing you both of these is the YJ is notorious for having bolts that are metric and standard all over the place. And in fact, when taking off the covers, as you'll see in later videos of this series, there is a good amount of metric that you have to deal with. But the engine internals itself, I've found the standard sockets seem to fit quite a bit better. So we're gonna start with these head bolts across here. They're gonna be on at a pretty heavy torque. Um, I cheated, I've had this off recently, and so they're not going to be for me. But for you, you're gonna to wanna to use a breaker bar. They're gonna be pretty tough. So let's zip these off real quick. All right, you should also take note that these guys have a little extra thread on top of them. The first four on the manifold side, okay? Those have some extra thread. So mark your bolts, take note of where they're coming from. That is always good. I'm just gonna gently set them back in their holes, because why not? <clears throat> Wow, don't do that. All right, before we get too far into this, I wanna throw a little disclaimer in there for you. I'll even look at you. Hey guys, so like I said, I just did an engine swap. This engine is actually slated to go back to the remanufacturing facility, which means that I don't really care a whole lot about it. It's not gonna ever run again for me. It'll, it's going to be machined here very soon. So with that being said, I'm not going to be taking all the precautions that you should totally be taking when tearing apart your own engine you intend to rebuild or run again. So if you are looking for all the proper precautions, be aware this is not the video for that. This is more to show you what the internals look like so you know what you're getting into. So yeah, anyway, you can slay me in the comments for that, but really, honestly, um, I'm going to do the best I can to show you what's going on and give you a better understanding of this engine. And that is it. Do not use this as a repair manual. Thanks guys. Okay. The first thing you're going to notice as we are tearing apart this engine and looking for what went wrong is this down here. You see how this is black and I don't know if the camera is picking this up, but I am actually knocking a hefty, hefty amount of carbon off of here. This entire engine is completely coated in carbon. And I believe that has something to do with the interval between oil changes as well as overheating. I think that it just baked the oil right into the steel. And so this engine had been overheated an aggressive amount of times. Uh, when I first bought it, knowing absolutely nothing about cars, I had no idea what temperature should, they should run at. And uh, I let it just overheat every single day because the thermostat had broken the opposite way of most thermostats and it had broken closed. And so I had no cooling for who knows how long until I finally looked at it and said, this is probably too hot. And then I started learning about cars and yeah, it was definitely too hot. So this engine had been overheated on a regular basis and I had gone intervals with how oil changes a little bit longer than I should have. Sometimes I would just forget which is bad. And on top of all of that, I also run this thing out of oil at some point, not knowing that it was burning oil and not checking. And yeah, so 
With that being said, we have a ton of carbon buildup, which is unique to this engine and not a good thing. But let's take a look at these guys here. These are rockers. So if you're not familiar with engines, you probably shouldn't be tearing apart one, but if you're here to learn, these rockers are push by push rods, which we will definitely be investigating here very soon. As the push rods move up and down as a result of the camshaft, which is housed down here, attached to the timing chain, these rockers are going to rock back and forth, compressing these springs, which open up valves, which I'll show you again in a minute. And that is what allows air to enter and exit your engine is through those valves. So air comes in here, the valve opens up, allows the air in, explosion happens, air comes out here. And that is, these are what's allowing it to do it. And that energy is coming from the camshaft, which is housed down below on a push rod engine. So let's take one of these off and take a look at it. This is a half inch socket. Not overly tight, so you don't have to prepare for that, which is great. Okay, again, keep track of your bolts and where they came from. I'm going to put this one hang out over here, and this one's going to hang out on the other side, just so I keep all of that aligned. Now, let's take a look at this. We have this guy here, which I'm going to put the name of on the screen because I don't actually know what it's called. Sorry. All right, but it looks like some kind of strap, right? And it has these guys here. You see that this is a rounded surface. The rocker is allowed to rock on that surface. And it appears that these are oil guides of some kind. That would be my best guess as to what they are. And they're incredibly dry, which is fun. All right, so there is that strap. And then here's the rocker. So the rocker, again, Strap goes in there, that curved surface. Looks like an oil guide of some kind. We have a hole up here, which I'll talk about later. I believe oil comes out of the push rod, goes in here, and then is going to then travel into this little pocket. This right here interfaces with your valve, and that's going to push down. You see it's nice and shiny from years and years of use. And there you go, that's the rocker. Both of them come off, and you can see the push rods back there as well. Very, very simple. All right, friends, unfortunately, this is the part where I don't have the correct tools, so we're not gonna be taking these guys out of here because I don't have the correct spring compressing mechanisms. But what we are gonna do is we're going to remove the head and we're going to take a look at the underside so you get an idea as to what is going on in here. These push rods, they are loose, so you can just take them out. You might have to lift up the head just a little bit to loosen them from the rockers, but they just come right on out. Okay, this is your cylinder head. This cylinder head features a single intake and a single exhaust. And some of the newer engines, they will feature four total, so two intake, two exhaust, and that's just to improve airflow at higher RPM, which this engine is not known for. It's not known for high RPM at all. So anyway, air comes in, air goes out. This hole here, this is for your spark plug. Spark plug goes in here and that's going to ignite the fuel air mixture, which allows you to drive your car. Hooray. All right, so you can see in here, I have some carbon buildup. I also have some buildup on the valves, which is pretty cool, I guess. Okay, another thing to note, and I'm gonna throw an image on the screen, is that when looking into the ports, you could see that one cylinder had an excessive amount of oil in the exhaust port, whereas the others were relatively dry. And so that's telling me that that cylinder had quite a bit of blow by, which is when the oil from the bottom of the engine, all that is coming up through and around the piston, which is bad because then you're gonna be burning said oil and that's not the most economic way to drive a car nor is it the most efficient. Also, you will note here, 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 these two, these two, these two, those are all paths for water. Your engine requires coolant, of course, and 
that allows the coolant to flow through the head. And then of course on the front of said head is where you feature that thermostat, which is super important because this is how it exits the engine to go to your radiator, which then cools it. So really good. I'm gonna do a test where we fill these pockets here on the head with water. And then we're also gonna put some spark plugs in garbage spark plugs. We're going to fill it with water and we're going to see if the water seeps out. That will then tell us if we had a leak in compression through the head, which would then tell me again if the head contributed to my low compression issue. You can see we've got spark plugs inserted into the spark plug holes and we're going to fill this with water and see where it comes out, if at all. If it doesn't come out, then we have very good compression. If it does come out, and we know exactly why. And just fill little pools. And ideally you don't spill over the edge because that could prove false results. Let's check back on these in a little bit. I let the water sit in the cylinder head overnight, which proved to be not a great idea as far as corrosion goes, because look at that, it just got all kinds of nasty. But, so we're going to take a look at the ports. It's going to be a little difficult to see because I don't want to move any of this. Uh, otherwise, some water might slosh around and mess up the results. But we're going to take a look at the ports and see if any leaked. So this is cylinder four. You can see there's a little bit of water in the exhaust port. The intake looks okay. Cylinder three is dry on both accounts. Cylinder two, we have water coming through exhaust, none on intake, and cylinder one is the same story, water coming through exhaust and none on the intake. All right, we're gonna look in just one of the exhaust ports here, and it's gonna be on the top, because remember we were upside down. You can see the water, and it came in from around that valve. Um, this one, was relatively dry. You can see the water wanted to come in but was unable. Cylinder 2 was pretty wet. Hey guys, and thank you for tuning in to part 1 of this engine teardown video. If you liked this video, go ahead and tell me by smashing the like button and leaving a comment down below. Also, if you like videos like this, there's a lot more coming, so hit subscribe and tune in for part 2.